Do you understand why we use CPAP when somebody goes into heart failure? I didn't used to understand. Now I do. Let me explain it to you. So before we dive into what CPAP actually does, it's probably first good to try and understand the mechanisms um, that are involved that will help CPAP help our patients. So we're going to start by looking at the right side of the heart, the lungs and the left side of the heart to understand the pathway that the blood and the fluid takes through the heart and the lungs. So if we start on the right side of the heart, we have deoxygenated blood returning from the body via the um, superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. And this is known as, and this is a term that I'm going to be coming up with a few times, and this is what we call venous return. So this is the blood coming back from the body to the heart itself. And as you probably already know, that blood is then going to flow into the right atrium, the right ventricle, and then into the lungs via the pulmonary artery. So it's returning to the lungs, it's going through the lungs via that very important artery, and it's going to be oxygenated there. So once it's oxygenated, it's then coming out of the lungs and returning to the heart via the pulmonary veins. And now we have oxygenated blood. So we've got the pulmonary veins now. And you're going to have that blood return to the left atrium, the left ventricle, and then finally go around the body via the aorta. So that's the route that that blood is going to take from the body into the heart to the lungs and then back into the heart and around the body. So that's the healthy heart. That's assuming that the heart and the pulmonary circulation are all working absolutely fine. The blood will flow through, there will be no problems, it will flow out again and then return um, to the body and then eventually back to the heart. But what's going to happen if the heart isn't so healthy? And these are the kinds of patients that will present with this congestive heart failure issue. So why wouldn't it be healthy? Well, for example, patients who have had an MI, whereby there's been some damage to the wall of the ventricle, and the ventricle therefore no longer beats as effectively or contracts as effectively as it should be doing. People with peripheral vascular disease can also compromise their heart function as that peripheral vascular disease raises the pressures within their peripheral circulation. Those back pressures eventually are going to manifest themselves in the heart that's having to push against them. Remember the heart has to push against those pressures in something called afterload. So afterload is basically the systemic vascular resistance against which the heart is having to contract. It could also be that they have things like valve issues. So something like an aortic stenosis, um, which is going to cause problems with the flow of the blood through the heart, again creating some pressure issues um, for the patient. And it can just be simple aging um, of the actual ventricle itself. So what's happening here to the heart itself? Well, there could be a number of things. What can happen is that the ventricle can gradually start to enlarge. So it grows bigger, it becomes a bigger muscle as it tries to contract against the higher pressures in the circulation um, or tries to contract to compensate for the patient have having an MI, for example. So this muscle gradually gets bigger and bigger which initially sounds great um, because then it can still contract, it can still provide the cardiac output that the body needs. But eventually it becomes like an old piece of elastic. You may have heard this analogy many times. New piece of elastic, stretch, contract, stretch, contract. Old piece of elastic, stretch, doesn't contract so well, stretch, doesn't contract so well. So the, the impact on that for the patient is that eventually 
their cardiac output will start to fall. So the ventricle is no longer contracting so well, so it isn't ejecting as much blood within this ventricle around the aorta as it should be doing. So what will happen is that the ventricle will then start to fill and this creates a rise in pressure within the ventricle itself. The other problem the patient could have um, is that because as this muscle starts to grow, it doesn't just grow outwards, it actually grows inwards as well. So it starts to narrow this chamber, the ventricle itself. So actually the ventricle is unable to fill with as much fluid because it's smaller and the fluid it does fill up in a smaller space also creates a rise in pressures. And what impact does this have? Well this rise in pressure will start to back up until eventually it's starting to back up into the lungs. Remember that um, the lungs is where the blood is actually coming from. And what you'll have as a consequence of that is something called pulmonary hypertension. Which means that the pressures now in the pulmonary circulation are much higher than ideally you would want them to be. So why is that? possibly an issue for the patient when they start to suffer with things like congestive heart failure. Well to understand that we're just going to talk about the role of fluid within the lungs itself and the things that drive the fluid across that membrane which will eventually cause the patient to develop problems with congestive heart failure. So there's three things we need to consider when we talk about the way fluid moves across the membranes within the lung. So you can see I've got an image of the lung here. So we've got a capillary, we've got the interstitium, and then we've got the lung itself. So remember within the capillary, we've got lots of blood cells moving through that capillary, supplying the oxygen and taking away the carbon dioxide. So the, the main issue here then is something we call hydro static pressure because essentially the pressure here is higher than the pressure down here. It's like the garden hose. If you turn the hose on at the tap, the pressure at the tap end will be quite high. If you go all the way down to the end of the garden hose, the pressure will be lower at that end of the garden hose. So because of this increased pressure, this hydrostatic pressure, the pressure being higher at one end than the other, so higher here than here, what this does is it creates a pressure that will drive the fluid across this membrane into the interstitium. Now the whole pulmonary circulation is a very low pressure system anyway, so any minor changes will make a big difference. Um, but what will happen um, if it was just down to hydrostatic pressure is that the pressure would be inclined to move the fluid across that way um, and probably not so much back this way because of the pressure differences. Okay, so if it was just hydrostatic pressure, all the fluid would move into the interstitium, which is not what we want. So there is a counteracting mechanism to this. So remember we've got our blood cells and those blood cells can't actually cross the membrane because they're too big. But also in there we have other um, but also in there we have other substances um, called proteins. And one of the major proteins, and I'll draw those in green here, is albumin. This is a protein that's made in the liver and it's very very important to the function of the body and that's because this creates something called oncotic pressure. So what does that mean? Well, um, water will move from a region of high concentration to an area of low concentration so it will try and even up the concentrations so if the concentration of albumin on one side of the membrane is quite high, the water will try to move from the other side of the membrane across 
to try and even up the concentration gradients. And this is exactly the function of albumin in this situation. So because of the presence of the albumin, this draws water from the interstitium back into the capillary, which is counteracting the hydrostatic pressure mechanism that we spoke about before. So this helps counteract that mechanism. So the presence of albumin is very important. So typically patients with a low albumin are at risk of things like edema and ascites because they lose this oncotic pressure due to the reduction in the amount of albumin in their circulation. And then the final part of this puzzle is something we call capillary leak. So these capillaries aren't completely intact. They have small holes in the walls of them. And like I said earlier, blood can't move through them and the bigger proteins like albumin can't move through those gaps either. But some fluid can actually leak through. So normally you do get a bit of fluid leaking through anyway, but when you are well and healthy, a lot of this fluid is then carried away by the lymphatic system. Now obviously if that capillary leak becomes worse, for example in the septic patient where those holes become bigger, um, there will be more fluid going into the interstitium and eventually the lymphatic system can't cope with all this fluid and the fluid then begins to back up and mount up. Okay, So those are the principles of fluid movement which will help us understand how CPAP works. So let's move on to talk about that. So in order to understand how CPAP actually helps, and CPAP is continuous positive airways pressure, we need to understand what's happening in the thoracic cavity when we breathe in and out. More importantly, when we breathe in. So what happens when we breathe in? So what happens is that the diaphragm moves down and the ribs move up and out. And what this does is increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. Okay, Remember the thoracic cavity isn't just the lungs, we've got the heart in there as well as lots of other important structures, but we've got the lungs and the heart in there. Now this increase in volume, if you increase the volume, what you will do is drop the pressure because now those molecules have got a bigger space in which to whiz around. Um, there's less of them bouncing off the walls of that space, which reduces the pressure that they actually um, in, uh, produce within that thoracic space. So if you've dropped the pressure, and remember this is a fairly closed system, what will happen is that you draw air into the lungs. So breathing in is active, we move the diaphragm down, the ribs up, and breathing out is passive. Everything relaxes and just bounces back to what it would have been normally. So that's the mechanism of breathing in and out. But the important part of this as far as CPAP is concerned is that what we also got in here is, of course, our heart. So what's happening here when we breathe in? The drop in pressure will also affect the heart itself. So if you can imagine that we now breathe in, so our pressure in our atria will drop. If the pressure in the atria drops as we breathe in, this essentially helps suck some more blood into the heart itself on the right and the left side of the heart. So every time we breathe in, we actually suck a little bit more blood into there. Now the problem for the sick patient is that um, because the ventricle on this side is struggling, for example, and not able to eject so much blood around the body, it's gradually filling up with more and more blood. And like I said, the pressures in here are going to start to go up as a consequence and eventually manifest themselves in the lungs, which remember is a low pressure system, doesn't cope well with rises in the pulmonary circulation, causing those fluids, the hydrostatic pressure will get higher, which we talked about before, pushing more fluid across. So what we want to do is perhaps reduce this drop in pressure 
on the right and left sides of the heart because if we reduce the drop in pressure then this sucking mechanism that's happening here will also be reduced. The suck will be reduced so not so much fluid will actually return to the heart. So what we're trying to do is reduce venous return which essentially will allow the heart to recover a little. It's not got so much blood coming back to it, so it's not having to pump at such high pressures, which means that we reduce the pressure in the pulmonary circulation as well, stopping some of that fluid moving across, allowing the lymphatic system to ha actually cope and drain some of that fluid away, which is going to start gathering in the interstitium, and at its worst will also then gather in the alveoli, creating that typically breathless, poorly saturated uh, patient who may have an element of pulmonary edema as well um, and obviously in a great deal of respiratory distress. So we're going to give them CPAP because what CPAP will do, it will actually, this drop in pressure as we breathe in, so if we have a drop in pressure as we breathe in normally, because we're now applying CPAP, so some positive pressure, that drop in pressure as a consequence will be reduced. So now we just have a smaller drop in pressure. So the sucking mechanism isn't so strong, dragging fluid back into the heart. And one of the other things that we commonly do when we treat these patients if we, is that we give them vasodilators. And the most common ones are the nitrates. So things like GTN. So we give them nitrates and the reason for doing that is because we also want to try and drop the venous return with that as well. So if you can imagine if our veins are quite tight, the pressure in here is also going to be quite tight. If we make those veins bigger, we vasodilate them a bit like we talked about the thoracic cavity. If you make it bigger, the pressure drops down. So now we are going to drop the pressure in the veins. And if there's less pressure in the veins, that means that we are also thereby dropping the venous return. So we're going to give them CPAP to try and add a bit of positive pressure to stop that sucking mechanism into the ventricles. Uh, and the um, So we're going to give them CPAP to try and drop that sucking mechanism into the atria and the ventricles and eventually affecting the heart itself. So we're going to give them CPAP to drop that sucking mechanism into the atria of the ventricles and eventually the lungs. And we're also going to give them vasodilators, things like the nitrates, um, to try and vasodilate them and also drop the pressure and reduce the venous return. So CPAP is about reducing the venous return when it comes to congestive heart failure. Hope that helps. There'll be more videos soon.